Hey there class, Professor Steve here. Um, and as the first group of uh, heterotrophic consumers that we're going to cover um, could arguably be considered the, the most important group and, and that is the uh, microbial portion of the consumer food web. So when we said when we characterize uh, or categorize the heterotrophs um, that we had both prokaryotes and eukaryotes and there are single celled and multi single celled I should say versions of both of these guys that are the first level consumers. Um, and we'll start with the prokaryotes, which here's the most important thing you can take home about those guys. The prokaryotic consumers consume dissolved organic matter only. All right, so it's this for this mini lecture. We're going to be looking at uh, from this size range consumer down, not the not the viruses, but um, we're going to look at the bacteria plankton and the protozooplankton. So the protozoa that that eat bacteria. But first, the bacteria. So again, take home message: they can consume only dissolved organic material, and really, they're the only guys that can consume dissolved organic material. Um, but uh, basic classification. Uh, for the most part free living single cells so they float around as single cells here you can see a micrograph or uh, sorry fluorescent image microscopic image that I took of some fluorescing bacteria um, for the most part they're modal some of them aren't some of them grow on surfaces some of them don't don't move around on their, by their own volition but most of them do and on scales of their body length it's unexpe unexpectedly fast so if you put their speed in terms of human body lengths they would actually be much much faster than us um, on average in a in a in a clear uh, milliliter which is a cubic centimeter of seawater on average is about 10 to the 6th or 1 million bacterial cells floating around in in the ocean so there's a lot of bacteria and this is without this is before they even have a, a good growth spurt um, and 70 90 percent 70 to 90 percent is estimated of all primary production um, eventually becomes a bacteria and that's really because of this they the only things that can consume DOM and ultimately everything ends up as DOM so if we modify um, this uh, food chain diagram to to suit this lecture for the bacteria with the guys that dis consume only DOM um, if you recall we have these interactions between across a whole food web they either eat each other or affect each other because of something that that something down the food chain eats whether it's a nutrient or, or all the way down the food chain but in these interactions and as these things grow and and reproduce they all produce dissolved organic molecules whether that's uh, so when they consume each other uh, we actually have a scientific term called sloppy feeding <laughs> and that is truly what we call it but um, as they chew on each other and I say quote unquote chew on each other because not everything physically chews um, there is release of organic ma material as cells are broken open as something's consumed and chewed on uh, we re release some dissolved organic matter but they also have waste products right everything excretes and has waste burns energy um, and produces dissolved organic matter in that way they also eventually all have to die, right? Everything's got an expected life cycle, if a, or a lifetime, a generation time, and if it hasn't been eaten by something, it eventually it's going to die, be decomposed, broken down into dissolved organic molecules. So that is to say that everything that consumes something else grows, reproduces, what have you. So every organism on Earth eventually ends up, or or contributes to, a global dissolved organic um, matter pool. The only organisms that can take that up are bacteria. Their cells are designed to have extracellular, which means on the outside of their cells, enzymatic activity, so that when these cells meet a, a bacterial cell, they can break it down, internalize it, and grow and reproduce like crazy. Um, and that is the only way that dissolved organic matter gets mobilized. Um, uh, if if humans were to um, if humans were to uh, consume uh, dissolved matter directly, um, you just wouldn't be able to consume enough to support you. We have to eat large, compact, prepackaged things to make our living. Uh, same with most larger heterotrophs, like a fish. Um, uh, if we wanted to take it one step up and eat enough bacteria to support ourselves, we'd have to culture them to such high levels that they would basically make us sick. Um, so, so in order to mobilize 
organic matter, which everything ends up as, and that's why we say 70 to 90 percent of it ends up as a bacteria, the bacteria have to first take it up. But then we couldn't consume the bacteria again because we'd have to grow it to high levels and drink it and it'd be it'd make us sick. So where does the organic matter go once it's a bacteria? And the answer is into a protozoa. All right, so we're still talking about microbes, but in order to move that organic matter from the bacterial biomass to from bacteria up the food chain, it has to be consumed by something else. And the major consumer of of bacteria are protozoa. Uh, one of the bigger ones are are ciliates. Uh, there's all different size ranges and classes, and um, and uh, you know they can range from actually lower than this, you know on the order of five microns all the way up to 200 microns. Um, we're talking about single celled, some of them live in colonies, but for the most part we're talking about single cells that swim around on their own. They can eat bacteria, but they're also, a lot of them are herbivores, they eat only phytoplankton. Um, and a good many of them are, are mixotrophic, which means they eat both. They're mainly filter feeders. Um, and they have the possibility, uh, capability of consuming tens of thousands of phytoplankton or bacteria per hour each individual. So, so they really are, are voracious consumers. And here's a good example of that. And we can see a swarm of bacteria that's grown over here and the cilia is just swimming through this swarm and consuming them like crazy. If we label these bacteria and make them fluoresce and show sort of the same thing, you can see these ciliates swimming around, um, all full of labeled bacteria. And if you look in here, uh, each one of these little round dots that you see in here is a food vacuole. Each one can contain anywhere between 10 and 70 to 100 bacteria, depending on how big the, the ciliate is. Uh, and you could basically turn themselves into um, feeding factories and can fill almost every single space of their bodies with them. Um, with bacteria. And so you can see how they would be um, such an important factor in transferring organic matter up the food chain. All right here's a quick video to show you just an example of, of filter feeding. Now this is a rotifer, it's a multicellular consumer, it's not a protozoa, but it gives you the general idea and shows you how they can create feeding currents. They can either swim around ciliates and pro other protozoa and, and just capture things as they filter things out of the water as they swim around or they can create these feeding currents that just draw all these particles in and each one of these particles is, is a bacteria here. So that's filter feeding. Uh, the next group of protozoa, important consuming protozoa, is the flagellates. And we call, I say heterotrophic flagellates because you remember we learned about the dinoflagellates, which are basically primary producers. And they're basically in the same group, single celled. Um, they can be a bit smaller, 2 to 100 microns. They eat both bacteria and, and phytoplankton. These guys are more of an interception. They can do filter feeding, but a lot of them are interception feeding or active predators. They go out, capture, and eat. They consume less bacteria than the ciliates, but they're usually about 30 times more abundant, so they kind of average out that way. Uh, the next group, the next couple uh, types are both uh, different forms of another protozoa, um, and they're both types of amoeba. Um, so these amoebae uh, foraminifera, or sh for short forams, they same thing. They can eat both. They can be both herbivores and consumers. A lot of them eat both. Um, but these guys are active predators, and they use calcium. Car they make calcium carbonate shells, a lot like the phytoplankton coccolithophores. Um, and if you remember, that's important for sedimentation and sinking and making what we call ooze, which I didn't bring this up before, but that's kind of what we call the uh, biogenic cilia, uh, sediments that are made mostly of shells of organisms. So along with something like a coccolith, they can make these calcium carbonate sediments. Um, another amoeba called radiolaria uh, make opal, or a skeleton made out of silicon, skeletons just like the diatoms do. So this is these are kind of the heterotrophic counterparts to some of the phytoplankton and they eat some of the phytoplankton. They make these shells, and they stick out their gooey uh, tentacles in amoeba form to grab things and these two can can sink and so can diatoms to form sediments that are mainly made out of silica. So we'd call that a silica ooze or sediment. Here's a video uh, showing a radiolaria uh, I'm sorry, this is a foram traveling through uh, some water column here, and you can see that it's long tentacles just kind of shooting out and 
grabbing onto particles and see these tentacles shooting out, grabbing particles, pulling it into themselves and consuming them. And so they're capable of consuming quite a bit of, um, of bacteria at a time. Okay, so when you put all these guys together, the bacteria consuming organic matter, the, protozo the protozooplankton consuming the bacteria, uh, the phytoplankton producing all the stuff that these guys are originally consuming, um, we get what's termed hot spots um, and the creation of the organic continuum. Uh, this is a concept uh, put forward by uh, Farouk Azam, a very big uh, marine microbiologist, and the concept really is quite simple. So you have phytoplankton doing primary productivity. Um, they are dying and excreting and reproducing and producing um, organic matter, right? They're either in the form of their particle, of their of their cell, their self, their 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 single cells, or organic matter in the form of um, of excreted stuff. Or when they die, things stick to them. Organic matter they get kind of gooey and start to decompose. So then you have free bacteria that come in and live off of this organic matter. They stick to it. They take some of it out of the water column. Um, then you have protozoa that come in and they eat the bacteria. So what you have is this clump of activity that we call hot spots. And when you get really big chunks, you know, a whole bunch of phytoplankton sticking together, a whole bunch of bacteria, they're all eating, they're all excreting, they're all dying and sticking together. Uh, organic matter is being produced and consumed, and uh, in a in a mass that I like to call snot. Um, and in the in the when it becomes big enough to sink, we call it marine snow in the in the in the ocean. Sometimes you've seen video of of a water column, and you just see all these particles raining down, sort of just floating down, and it looks like snow. We call that marine snow. So we get protozoa coming in here, feeding on this, and each one of these things we consider a hot spot, depending on how much organic matter and growth and, and eating is going on there, the hotspot can be kind of um, spread out and thin, or it can be very thick and heavy, full of activity. Now you can picture this goes on throughout the entire ocean to varying degrees, depending on how much growth and organic matter there is and how much uh, heterotrophic consumption um, and decaying and then consumption by protozoa there are. So in it can happen, you can have one of these these whole total picture of hotspots in one milliliter or one cubic centimeter, which is the same thing, of seawater. You can have these hotspots. But then if you expand out to one liter of cubic liter of water, I'm sorry, one liter or one cubic meter of water, you can have a whole bunch of these hotspots, right? And this is an exaggeration. There's actually many more than this in one cubic liter. And each one of these pictures is interconnected by this organic matter continuum. Okay, so we have really a whole bunch of group of hotspots. There's a trail of organic matter that connects it and growth and activity that connects it to a really other big bunch of hotspots. And depending on how active that part of the ocean is, um, is what is what um, determines just how strong these lines of interconnectivity are. So less organic matter, less activity, less growth, and these are weak connections, but they're still there. But more organic matter, more activity, more growth, and these connections become a lot stronger. And you could take this cubic meter, and you can stack a whole bunch of them on top of each other and make a cubic uh, kilometer of ocean and just keep going and going, and you get varying degrees of these interconnected hotspots, and that's what we call the organic continuum. If we were to look at it on a size scale, the organic continuum, um, and in terms of dissolved or particulate carbon, organic carbon, um, we see a familiar pattern here with size above a millimeter to um, tens of microns. Here's the zooplankton eating on the phytoplankton, and some of these zooplankton are those protozooplankton, proto the ciliates and the flagellates and amoebae we just talked about. Um, here's the bacteria doing their job, and you see that their size ranges below a micron um, almost into what we would consider dissolved, something that could pass through a filter. Viruses are very small, they can pass through a filter, but these guys are all eating, growing, excreting, dying, sticking together, and cycling this organic matter, and we get these production and degradation, consumption and cycling of macromolecules, such as the carbohydrate, single carbohydrate molecule, or if there are a bunch of them stuck together, let's say 10 of them, then we get something that we call micro or nanogels. They start to become this gelatinous material. And then if we stack even more together, you know, we start to get things we could see with our eye, macro gels, so larger jellies and 
bunches of snot, something that we call transparent um, exopolymer, stuff that's just created by other organisms. Thanks for joining me. See you next lecture.